Section twelve of the American Book of the Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The American Book of the Dog, G. O. Shields, Editor. Section twelve The Bloodhound by J. L. Winchell. Beginning with two poems from scott in the lady of the lake two dogs of black st hubert breed unmatched for courage breadth and speed fast on his flying traces came and all but won that desperate game for scarce a spear's length from his haunch vindictive toiled the bloodhound staunch nor nearer might the dogs attain nor farther might the quarry strain thus up the margin of the lake between the precipice and break or stock and rock their race they take and lay of the last minstrel and hark and hark the deep-mouthed bark comes nigher still and nigher bursts on the path the dark bloodhound his tawny muzzle tracked the ground and his red eye shot fire addison in the spectator contends that the english bloodhound is a descendant from vulcan's dogs in proof of his statement he adds this bit of history quote, it is well known by the learned that there was a temple on mount edna dedicated to vulcan which was guarded by dogs of so exquisite a smell says the historian that they could discern whether the person that came thither was chaste or otherwise they used to meet and fawn upon such as were chaste caressing them as friends of their master vulcan but flew at those that were polluted and never ceased barking at them till they were driven from the temple after that they lived there in great repute for several years it so happened that one of the priests who had been making a charitable visit to a widow who lived on a promontory of lilybeam returned home late in the evening the dogs flew at him with so much fury that they would have killed him if his brethren had not come to his assistance, upon which the dogs were all of them hanged as having lost their original instinct. End quote. If this had taken place in the nineteenth century, the priest would have been hanged, and the dogs would have won collars inscribed with words of commendation and glory until comparatively recent times these hounds were only to be found in the kennels of the nobility and even now well-bred bloodhounds are in the hands of very few breeders and are all closely related jesse says the earliest mention of bloodhounds was in the reign of henry the third the breed originated from the talbot which was brought over by william the conqueror and seems to have been very similar to the saint hubert a breed from the st hubert's abbey in ardennes which according to the old legends was imported by st hubert from the south of gaul about the sixth century the talbot was the popular hound from the twelfth to the sixteenth century but became extinct about the end of the last century the southern hound another very old breed showing many characteristics of the bloodhound is difficult to find now in his pure state although many of our old packs of harriers are descended chiefly from him the best authorities agree that the st hubert talbot and bloodhound are all closely allied End quote. this quote from edwin burrow in the century in the twelfth century henry the third gave the following instruction quote, whereas edward the king's son has entrusted to robert de cheney his valet his dogs to be accustomed to blood it is commanded to all foresters woodmen and other bailiffs and servants of the king's forests the keepers of the king's warrens that they allow the said robert to enter with them the king's forests and warrens and to hunt with them and to take the king's game in order to train the said dogs this to hold good till the feast of st michael next ensuing witness the king at woodstock twenty february forty henry the third which would mean february twentieth a d twelve fifty six we can have no better authority of the period than that of the statements of dr keynes written between fifteen fifty five and fifteen seventy two 
the greater sort which served to hunt having lips of a very large size and ears of no small length do not only chase the beast while it liveth but being dead by any manner of casualty make recourse to the place where it lieth having in this point an assured and infallible guide namely the scent and savour of the blood sprinkled here and there upon the ground these kind of dogs pursue the deed doers through long lanes crooked reaches and weary ways without wandering away out of the limits of the land whereon these desperate purloiners prepared their speedy passage yea the nature of these dogs is such and so effectual is their foresight that they can bewray separate and pick them out from among an infinite multitude and an innumerable company creep they never so far into the thickest throng they will find him out notwithstanding he lie hidden in wild woods in close and overgrown groves and lurk in hollow holes apt to harbour such ungracious guests moreover although they should pass over the water thinking thereby to avoid the pursuit of the hounds yet will not these dogs give over their attempt but presuming to swim through the stream persevere in their pursuit and when they be arrived and gotten the further bank they hunt up and down to and fro run they from place to place shift they until they have attained to that plot of ground where they passed over and this is their practice if perdue they cannot at ye first time smelling find out that way which the deed doers took to escape for they will not pause or breathe from their pursuits until such time as they be apprehended and taken which committed the fact these hounds when they are to follow such fellows as we have before rehearsed use not that liberty to range at will which they have otherwise when they are in game except under necessary occasion whereon dependeth an urgent and effectual persuasion when such purloiners make speedy way in flight but being restrained and drawn back from running at random with the leash the end whereof the owner holding in his hand is led guided and directed with such swiftness and slowness whether he go on foot or whether he ride on horseback as he himself in haste would wish for the more easy apprehension of these venturous varlets in the borders of england and scotland the often and accustomed stealing of cattle so procuring these kind of dogs are very much used and they are taught and trained up first of all to hunt cattle as well of the smaller as of the greater growth and afterwards that quality relinquished and left they are learned to pursue such pestilent persons as plant their pleasure in such practices of purloining as we have already declared two or three centuries ago the bloodhound was much used in england and scotland not only to track felons but to pursue political offenders they were kept at one time in great numbers on the border of scotland and not only set upon the trail of moss troopers but upon fugitive royalty bruce was repeatedly tracked by these dogs and on one occasion only escaped death from their jaws by wading a considerable distance up a brook and thus baffling their scent a sure way of stopping a dog was to spill blood and thus destroy its discriminating powers a captive was sometimes sacrificed on such occasions a story of william wallace is related as follows the hero's little band had been joined by an ally a dark savage suspicious character after a sharp skirmish at black Ankside, wallace was forced to retreat with only a section of his followers the english pursued with border bloodhounds in the retreat the ally tired or appeared to do so and would go no farther wallace having in vain argued with him in hasty anger struck off his head and continued his retreat the english came up but the hounds refused to leave the dead body and the fugitive escaped End quote. the bloodhound has for many centuries been a favorite in england he came with the conquerors and was their faithful follower then as he is their companion now and some of the old english lords point with pride to their favorite hounds and say this same strain has been with our family since the conquest who can doubt the ancient ancestry of the bloodhound when we note his sedate and stately bearing his thoughtful dignified manner these bespeak at once his ancient lineage and his long-extended pedigree which is written on his wrinkled face and in his deep-set eyes 
they were used by henry the eighth in the wars in france by queen elizabeth against the irish and by the spaniards in mexico and peru quoting edwin burrow in the century at a still later time bloodhounds were used for the capture of sheep stealers and others and a tax was often levied for their maintenance for this purpose it is only in very old writings that we find talbots or white bloodhounds mentioned the thick round head somerville describes would certainly not be admired now and i believe was never an accurate description of the bloodhound a long narrow peaked head is indicative of great scenting powers and large flues and dewlap of a deep mellow voice the bloodhound has a much more delicate nose than any other known breed of hound and can puzzle out a cold scent under the most adverse conditions he is remarkable for adhering to the scent of the animal on which he is laid some years since a pack of staghounds was kept in derbyshire and it was no infrequent occurrence for the hunted deer to take refuge among a herd in some park in this case the pack was whipped off and a couple of bloodhounds laid on who stuck to the hunted deer until they got him clear of the herd when the pack was again laid on the bloodhound is easily entered to hunt anything and with a strong scent will sometimes absolutely sit down on his haunches for a few seconds and throw tongue in sheer delight the note is deep mellow and prolonged and may be heard for miles the bay or singing of a kennel of bloodhounds just before feeding or exercising is most melodious End quote. and here we quote hamerton on animals we make use of the delicate faculty of sense possessed by animals to aid us in the chase and are so accustomed to rely upon it that its marvelousness escapes attention but we have no physical faculty so exquisite as this every one who has gathered wild plants knows what an immense variety of odors arise from the sense upon the ground this is the first complication next upon that though we cannot detect it are traced in all directions different lines of scent laid down by the passage of animals and men this is the second complication well across these labyrinths of misleading and disturbing odours the dog follows the one scent that he cares for at the time notwithstanding its incessant adulteration by mixtures as easily as we could follow a scarlet thread on a green field if he were only sensible to the one scent he followed the marvel would be much reduced but he knows many different odours and selects among them the one that attracts him at the time there is a dog in the southern states called the bloodhound used to find escaped prisoners and desperadoes which is somewhat related probably to the english bloodhounds and there are well-trained packs of them but as a general rule the cross-breed dog is a treacherous one they are so well trained that they hardly ever attack the man pursued if he remains quiet and does not resist not long since the desperado was brought to a stand by three of these dogs they smelled him over but were perfectly friendly with no intention of harming him until he hearing his pursuers near him turned to run in an instant the hounds were upon him when the sheriff arrived with his men they found two dead hounds covered with knife wounds and the third uninjured with his terrible fangs fastened on the throat of the dying criminal the remarks of the sheriff at the time were worth pages of explanation quote, that fool just flung his life away fighting three dogs with a knife why didn't he keep still End quote. following is the description and value of points of the bloodhound as adopted by the american kennel club head twenty points ears and eyes ten flues five neck five shoulder and chest ten back and back ribs ten legs and feet fifteen color and coat ten stern five symmetry ten total one hundred points the head value twenty is the peculiar feature of this breed and i have accordingly estimated it at a very high rate in the male it is large in all its dimensions but width in which there is a remarkable deficiency 
the upper surface is domed ending in a blunt point at the occiput but the brain case is not developed to the same extent as the jaws which are very long and wide as the nostrils hollow and very lean in the cheek and notably under the eyes the brows are moderately prominent and the general expression of the whole head is very grand and majestic the skin covering the forehead and cheeks is wrinkled in a remarkable manner wholly unlike any other dog these points are not nearly so developed in the bitch but still they are to be demanded in the same proportionate degree ears and eyes value ten the ears are long enough to overlap one another considerably when drawn together in front of the nose the leather should be very thin and should hang very forward and close to the cheeks never showing the slightest tendency to prick they should be covered with very short soft silky hair the eyes are generally hazel rather small and deeply sunk showing the third eyelid or haw which is frequently but not always of a deep red colour this redness of the haw is as a rule an indication of bloodhound cross whenever it is met with whether in the mastiff gordon setter or st bernard though occasionally i have met with it in breeds in which no trace of the bloodhound could be detected the flues value five are remarkably long and pendant sometimes falling fully two inches below the angle of the mouth the neck value five is long so as to enable this hound to drop his nose to the ground without altering his pace in the front of the throat there is a considerable dewlap chest and shoulders value ten the chest is rather wide than deep but in all cases there should be a good girth shoulders sloping and muscular the back and back ribs value ten should be wide and deep the size of the dog necessitating great power in this department the hips or couples should be especially attended to and they should be wide or almost ragged legs and feet value fifteen many bloodhounds are very deficient in these important parts owing to confinement the legs must be straight and muscular and the ankles of full size the feet also are often flat but they should be if possible round and cat-like color and coat value ten in color the bloodhound is either black and tan or tan only as is the case with all black and tan breeds the black should extend to the back the sides top of the neck and top of the head it is seldom a pure black but more or less mixed with the tan which should be a deep rich red there should be little or no white a deep tawny or lion color is also coveted but seldom found the coat should be short and hard on the body but silky on the ears and top of the head the stern value five is like that of all hounds carried gaily in a gentle curve but should not be raised beyond a right angle with the back the symmetry value ten of the bloodhound as regarded from an artistic point of view should be examined carefully and valued in proportion to the degree in which it is developed people generally have a mistaken idea about the bloodhound they look upon him as a vicious animal one that will tear you to pieces the moment he gets to you this is not the case a pure english bloodhound is the most gentle dog in the world if he is laid on the trail of a man and overtakes him all the man has to do is to stop and he will not be harmed when you have once won the esteem of a bloodhound he is your friend for ever to illustrate their gentleness i will relate an incident a short time ago the duchess of ripple was lying by the grate in my house my little boy became convinced that her ears were too long and getting a pair of shears he got astride of her and began trimming them all the duchess did was to howl she offered the lad no violence and did not even try to run away when i got there i found the boy with the shears in one hand and the bleeding ear in the other nothing could have induced her to injure him the most striking characteristic of the bloodhound is his wonderful scenting power the duchess will follow a trail and be several rods away from it she will run parallel with it at great speed if she loses a trail she will make a circuit until she strikes it again and away she will go 
bloodhounds could be trained to do great police duty put one of them on the trail of a thief and he would not be long in locating the culprit i sold one to a man in detroit one night the man's horse got out of the barn and disappeared hours afterward the dog was put on the trail followed it for eight miles finally found the horse in a pasture and picked it out from among many other horses the bloodhound is in every sense a gentleman's dog when you have once won his esteem you may depend on him as your lifelong friend he has a stately bearing a thoughtful and dignified air to which his long pedigree and princely birth justly entitle him if you are fond of outdoor exercise what more exciting sport can be had than a run or witnessing one with these dogs if you want a new sensation or are overworked try it come out into the country start away some early morning a couple of hours ahead of the hounds with your stopping place in your mind then choose your course so you may enjoy the trailing of the hounds and hear their deep voices resounding in the chase as you sit in your chosen position watching them as they near you see them carefully casting for your trail under difficult circumstances hear their deep bell-like notes resounding in the dark forest and on the mountains with a cry unbroken the music the poetry of it as it rings through the clear air is a grand wild concert now faintly heard in low distant murmurs as it comes floating over the low hills then louder swelling and finally bursting in a grand chorus as they near you once heard it can never be forgotten why is this dog called a bloodhound many ask the name is a misnomer he is not bloodthirsty more than any other dog but it is owing to the peculiar instinct which he probably acquired in tracking wounded game could a pack of bloodhounds be trained so as to enter into the spirit of the chase on the stage could they be seen in their excitement heard in their full cry what a maddening encore they would receive let me quote edwin bro in the century when we consider the marvellous attributes of the bloodhound it is difficult to understand how it could possibly have gone almost out of use as it evidently did probably this decadence began when he was no longer required in border warfare as a matter of course the breed became scarce and was only kept up by old families who were loath to part from their ancient traditions or who had deer parks and used bloodhounds for tracking wounded deer fortunately dog shows came to the rescue or the breed would probably have by this time become extinct i fear that dog shows and their attendant changes of fashion have done an immense amount of harm to some of our most useful breeds but luckily the bloodhound has been estimated most highly for his best and most characteristic qualities and the long narrow peaked head always associated with special scenting powers and the long ears and immense dewlap indicative of voice are much more common now than ever before the chief alteration has been in the lines denoting speed and we now have a much faster hound than in the moss trooping days in fact many bloodhounds are quite as fast as average foxhounds we have however been intensifying the type and formation indicative of the special properties inherent in him and i am satisfied that with a reasonable amount of careful training we may obtain much more wonderful results in the tracking of criminals than have ever been attained before we have now few hounds trained to hunt the clean boot i e merely the natural scent of a man through his boots and the very few bloodhound owners who attempt anything of this kind do not devote sufficient time to the pursuit to bring their hounds to even a moderate degree of excellence i am convinced that the time has now come when we may hope to see this matter taken up in a more thoroughly intelligent manner and if this is done we shall in a few years be quite unable to understand why the bloodhound was ever allowed to fall into disuse for this purpose each succeeding generation of trained hounds must become much more proficient than the last one and when they have come into general use the deterrent effect on crime will be incalculable such detectives would be incapable of accepting a bribe and would often discover criminals when other means could only end in failure End quote. 
the bloodhound stands alone among all the canine race in his fondness for hunting the footsteps of entire strangers almost any dog will follow the footsteps of his master or of one whom he knows but a bloodhound will follow those of a stranger with all the eagerness of an old trained foxhound in close pursuit if he is first trained on man he will follow the trail of any animal for the trail left by man is less than that of any other bloodhounds kept for trailing man should be kept by themselves and great care should be exercised in keeping their quarters clean they should have their daily runs their feed should be always sweet and fresh a small piece of decayed meat will render a hound almost useless for hours and in training puppies it is best that the attendant should be a stranger to them mr edwin bro describes the method by which he has trained his so successfully for the last twenty years in the following words nothing more could be added only that if you wish them to show great proficiency you must give them abundant practice Quote, one method of training advocated is to rub the boots of the man who runs for the hounds with blood and to discontinue this gradually as the hounds become more expert this is a bad plan it is quite easy to enter bloodhounds without any artificial aid of this kind and it is much more difficult to get them to run man after they have become accustomed to a stronger scent i consider that hounds work better when entered to one particular scent and kept to that only and i never allow my hounds to hunt anything but the clean boot you can scarcely commence too early to teach puppies to hunt the clean boot i often give mine their first lessons when three or four months old for the first few times i find it best to let them run some one they know afterwards it does not matter how often the runner is changed he should caress and make much of the puppies and then let them see him start away but should get out of their sight as quickly as possible and run say two hundred yards upwind on grass land in a straight line and then hide himself the man who hunts the puppy should know the exact line taken and take the puppies over it trying to encourage them to hunt until they get to their man who should always reward them with a bit of meat this may have to be repeated several times before they really get their heads down but when they have once begun to hunt they improve rapidly and take great delight in the quest everything should be made as easy as possible at first and the difficulties increased gradually this may be done by having the line crossed by others by increasing the time before the puppies are laid on or by crossing roads etc when the puppies get old enough they should be taught to jump boldly and to swim brooks where necessary when the young hounds have begun to run fairly well it will be found useful to let the runner carry a bundle of sticks two feet or two feet six inches long pointed at one end and with a piece of white paper stuck in a cleft at the other end when he makes a turn or crosses a fence he should put one of these sticks down and incline it in the direction he is going to take next this will give the person hunting the hounds some idea of the correctness of their work though the best hounds do not always run the nearest to the line on a good scenting day i have seen hounds running hard fifty yards or more to the leeward of the line taken these sticks should be taken up when done with or they may be found misleading on some other occasion the hounds will soon learn to cast themselves or try back if they overrun the line and should never receive any assistance as long as they continue working on their own account it is most important that they should become quite self-reliant the line should be varied as much as possible it is not well to run hounds over exactly the same course they have been hunted over on some previous occasion if some hounds are much slower than the rest it is best to hunt them by themselves or they may get to score to cry as the old writers say instead of patiently working out the line each for himself it is a great advantage to get hounds accustomed to strange sights and noises if a hound is intended to be brought to such a pitch of excellence as will enable him to be used in thoroughfares he should be brought up in a town and see as much bustle as possible if he is only intended to be used in open country with occasional bits of road work this is not necessary bloodhounds give tongue freely when hunting any wild animal but many hounds run perfectly mute when hunting man 
this is however very much a matter of breeding some strains run man without giving tongue at all others are very musical any one who is fond of seeing hounds work but who has only a limited amount of country to hunt over will find an immense amount of pleasure in hunting man with one or two couples of bloodhounds in such circumstances it is a great convenience to be able to select the exact course which could not be done if hunting some animal and a great variety of different runs can be contrived over limited ground i know nothing more delightful than to see bloodhounds working out a scent carefully under varying circumstances and to hear their sonorous deep bell-like note there is not of course the slightest danger to the runner even if the hounds have never seen him before when they have come up and sniffed over him they manifest no further interest in him the head is the chief characteristic of the breed and should be estimated highly the skull is long in good dogs it generally exceeds eleven inches in length narrow and very much peaked muzzle deep and square ears thin long and pendulous set on low hanging close to the face and curled upon themselves eyes hazel coloured deep set with triangular shaped lids showing the haw flews long thin and pendulous the upper lip overhanging the lower one neck long with great quantity of loose skin or dewlap the skin of the face should be loose and wrinkled and when the nose is depressed a roll of loose skin should be seen on the forehead the coat should be close but rather silky in texture and the skin thin height dogs from twenty five to twenty seven inches at the shoulder bitches rather less shoulders deep and sloping brisket particularly well let down forming a sort of keel between the forelegs loins broad and muscular powerful muscular thighs and second thighs good legs and round feet hocks well bent tapering lashing stern the color most generally admired now is black and tan the legs feet and all or part of the face being a tan color and the back and sides and the upper part of the neck and stern black there is generally a white star on the chest and a little white on the feet is admissible some fifteen years since it was not at all uncommon to see white flecks on the back making the hound look as if he had been out in a snowstorm and a white tip to stern the former peculiarity seems unfortunately to be quite lost but the white tip to stern is still sometimes met with a deep red with tan markings is common but to my mind the most beautiful color of all is a tawny more or less mixed with black on the back it is however rare and i only know one or two hounds of this color the bitch is somewhat smaller than the dog and in her head properties is not so fully developed End quote. the illustrations are from well-known show dogs and are the best type of the bloodhound of today that of the three puppies is from a photograph taken on the day they were two months old they are the average ones of a litter of eleven which the dam raised without any assistance the sire was burgo dam rosemary they are of the st hubert type spoken of by sir walter scott they are darker in color and generally larger and more powerful than most of the breed one of this litter at six months old weighed over eighty pounds had ears measuring twenty-six inches and his head was twelve inches long champion barnaby is one of the best all-around bloodhounds of england his sire is champion nobleman dam brevity the red and tan duchess of ripple and the black and tan rosemary are proving themselves two of the best breeding bitches of england duchess is a great prize winner besides being the dam of more and greater show dogs than any bloodhound living her sire was tim bush the second dam patty rosemary her companion has probably more of the southern or st hubert blood than any bloodhound known the illustration of bono is from a photograph taken when he was twelve months old he is strong in all bloodhound points but is particularly grand in his head he has been shown at all the principal bench shows in the last year and never beaten 
besides winning the principal prize at the greatest show at manchester england the challenge cup for the best sporting dog unanimously awarded by all the judges of the different classes a wonderful record for a dog of his age i doubt if there is a dog in england that can score as many points his dam was the duchess of ripple the first kennel was exhibited here by mr edwin bro at the westminster kennel club's show in new york in february eighteen eighty eight in it were champion barnaby and duchess of ripple previous to this time i can safely say there was not a fair specimen ever exhibited at any of our shows probably the reason of their not being introduced here before was their scarcity and the price they commanded in england within the last two years we have imported bred and sold over seventy bloodhounds in america and have exhibited a kennel of them at our principal shows during that time they have gone to california mexico and texas and in the east have been taken principally by ladies as companions and have become a fashionable household dog to be a successful breeder means more than the rearing of many dogs there would have been no maud s sunal or axtel had their breeders followed the haphazard style of mating practised by many dog fanciers there is as much science in the production of a high-class dog as in the breeding of a great trotter strains properly united produce champions as well as great trotters the rearing of healthy puppies depends largely upon the sire and dam both before and after breeding their age hereditary constitutions and the frequency of breeding of the dam must all be looked to in order to obtain the best results once a year is as often as any bitch should be bred my aim is to keep my dogs in the most perfect show condition at all times more particularly my stud dogs and breeding bitches they have their morning lesson on the trail for an hour or so besides a large yard connected with their kennels supplied with running water they are well groomed every day and the kennels are kept clean at all times after the bitch has been bred i make no change in her treatment for a month or so then i begin gradually to reduce the amount of her exercise and to feed more liberally with a greater variety of food i probably feed more meat at all times than most breeders the bitch is transferred to her temporary whelping quarters long enough before the time she is to whelp to have her feel at home there i have her keeper or someone whom she is familiar with remain with her while whelping in order that he may render her or her puppies any assistance necessary most bitches are very sensitive at this period and must be treated with great gentleness none but those she is familiar with should be allowed near her during the first week or so after whelping when the puppies are about two days old she may be transferred to her permanent kennels after she has been cleaned and groomed she will probably not take exercise enough for her health unless taken out for a walk two or three times a day keep her warm do not let her become chilled feed her often anything she craves boiled mutton beef broth with bread and rice buttermilk etc keep fresh water always by her remove any remnant of her food when she is through eating i have raised eleven and twelve puppies respectively in two different litters from rosemary by this method of treatment at five weeks old so even a lot were they that one could scarcely be told from another when i commenced feeding the puppies which was when they were between four and five weeks old they were fed on nearly the same food i had been giving the dam but they were fed four or five times a day the keeper always remaining with them until they were through eating so as to encourage the weaker ones and restrain the stronger ones from imposing on the others their dishes were always removed and cleaned as soon as they were through eating the smaller and weaker puppies should be given cod liver oil twice a day it is a well-known fact that more puppies die from worms than from any other cause my remedy for this is the juice of pumpkin seeds given with their food and as a preventative charcoal or buttermilk Quote, exercise is most important for puppies 
they should always be either sleeping or running about except when eating if the weather is wet or cold they should have a roomy place under cover to run about in with large bones to pick or some other amusement the bone picking is necessary to keep the teeth in good order when two or three months old i take my puppies out to exercise in a field and as soon as they have become pretty handy on the road for a few times with a lad to whip in and then they go out for an hour's exercise daily with the other hounds when five or six months old they should be under nearly as good command as the old hounds if taught to lead at this age it is much less troublesome than when it has been left till they are nearly full grown with some puppies this is easy to accomplish others throw themselves about and are obstinate but soon resign themselves to their fate if handled quietly if a puppy declines to budge it is a mistake to pull him about forcibly wait until he decides to move and then let him go in the direction he prefers he will soon get accustomed to restraint and in a few days will allow you to choose the road if he then pulls unpleasantly he should be taught by a few taps on the nose with a switch to walk soberly at your side without straining at the chain preparation for the show bench in a properly kept kennel the dogs will always be in good show condition but if they are covered with skin diseases if alive with vermin or if they have been kept in dirty quarters they will need a great deal of preparation to fit them for the show bench your kennel cannot be a success unless you breed with an object in view if you breed good dogs the next consideration is that they shall be well kept a good kennel man is as rare as a good breeder in preparing dogs for the show bench one of the most important considerations is that they shall be well broken to the chain and shall not be afraid of strangers much depends on the way a dog appears in the ring before the judge the number of extra pounds of flesh which you may crowd on the dog will not win the prize with a good judge he should be given a gentle run or walk twice a day much as has been his habit and on his return he should be groomed and given dry sleeping quarters we often hear this old adage a good grooming is better for a horse than a feeding and it is equally applicable to a dog his general appearance will depend very much on the grooming he gets use nothing that will irritate the skin never exhibit puppies unless you are going out of the business you may escape distemper once but the people who may possibly buy your puppies may not be so fortunate in shipping to the show it is better to go with your dogs yourself or send a man to see that they get there safely and also to take them into the ring do not consider your kennels well kept unless your dogs are always in condition for the show bench nature has evidently intended the bloodhound as a companion a guardian a household pet the difficulty that has been experienced in england in rearing them does not exist here the change in climate food and surroundings seems to have infused new life into the breed and the bloodhound bitch that i received from england in whelp and from whom i was unable to raise more than three or four puppies without foster mothers after the second or third litter here raised eight to twelve i have no difficulty now in rearing as many puppies from my bloodhounds as from my mastiffs the breeders and trainers of the bloodhound both here and in england have always had one object in view namely the improvement of his natural scenting powers and most admirably they have succeeded americans have the credit of knowing a good thing when they see it and i have no doubt therefore that the bloodhound will become as great a favorite here as he is in england End of chapter twelve the bloodhound